Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today, I'm excited to be sharing another interview with Barbara Carnes, my recurring guest. And we're talking again about hospice issues. And today, Barbara is going to share about how to create a sacred space at the moment of death and after death. It's a beautiful, lovely conversation that I think you'll really enjoy. I want to also point you toward a tutorial video I made on how to create create a be ready kit I talk about, or it's also called a go bag that you can have available to you if you happen to get called away on urgent notice to be with someone or to sit vigil with someone you love and care about. And this is just a way to, in advance, think about some special items you might want to have with you in that situation and be prepared so that you can grab the bag and go in a short amount of time. I'll talk all about that in the tutorial. So look for that on this YouTube channel as well. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to hit the subscribe button down below and also subscribe and leave a rating and review for the podcast wherever you happen to listen to that. If you're so inclined, I appreciate any and all small contributions to help keep this podcast and channel on the air. So go to eoluniversity.com slash support and find out how you can help out. And thank you in advance if you choose to do that. So now on to my conversation with Barbara Carnes. Well, today I'm so happy to welcome back my returning guest, Barbara Carnes. We've mentioned before, we're going to be doing this every other month. So Barbara and I will get together and talk about issues related to caring for hospice patients, which I think will be really enlightening and informative for everyone who wants to listen in. So here we are ready for another conversation. For anyone who doesn't know Barbara or, or her work, I, I'll read her introduction, though most of us have probably are aware of Barbara, but Barbara is an internationally recognized author, speaker, thought leader, and expert on end-of-life care and the dynamics of dying. She, she is an RN. She was recognized in 2018 as a hospice innovator by the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization and was named the 2015 International Humanitarian Woman of the Year by the World Humanitarian Awards, which is such an impressive award. I can't even fathom that. Barbara is the author of the well-known book, Gone From My Sight, The Dying Experience, affectionately referred to in the hospice industry as the Little Blue Hospice Book. Gone From My Sight has sold over 30 million copies worldwide, is published in 12 languages, and remains the leading resource on the market today, educating families on the signs of approaching death. And if you've worked in a hospice, no doubt you have seen copies of Gone From My Sight, the Little Blue booklet in hospice because it's so frequently given out to families who are caring for a loved one. Barbara's most recent book is By Your Side, A Guide for Caring for the Dying at Home, which is, uh, I'm, I, I'm sure it's on its way to huge numbers of sales too, because it's a tremendous resource that everyone should have at home. So you can learn more about Barbara and her, all of her work and her books at the website bkbooks.com. So Barbara, welcome back. It's so good to see you again. Oh, it's good to see you too. I'm always happy to be here and have an exchange with you. Because, you know, me, me too. We've both have been enjoying these conversations so much. And uh, it's just nice to sit and chat with someone like-minded with we have some similar experiences some that are different but whenever we bring our knowledge and experiences together it usually ends up being something special that other people learn something from too so yeah. so uh, after a suggestion on social media a question that was asked uh, of barbara we decided that we were going to talk today about ideas uh, for what can be done immediately before and after a death. And so things to think about if you are working in hospice and you get called to come and do a death visit or, or if you're a death doula, or maybe even if you're a, a loved one or family member coming to call at the time of a death. And so Barbara has lots of thoughts on this topic. So I'm gonna turn it over 
to you, Barbara, to get started. And I guess we were going to talk initially about before, right before someone dies, things that we can do. Okay, what what I want us to start with is that to recognize that all of end of life work, the goal for end of life work is the patient's death. We want to everything we do before the death, uh, we're building up to that moment of support. And then following the death, we want to create comforting memories um, as the person goes into their grieving. I think it's important that we, the goal of all that I'm going to talk about today is to help create a sacred experience for the family and loved ones and those present at the moment of death. And if we can get them to create, if we can help create this sacred experience rather than a frightening, fearful one, they will carry that sacred memory with them forever. So as caregivers, it's really a huge responsibility that um, that moment of death and how it's handled. So in the hours, sometimes days, but generally hours before death, for the professional that is there, I see their role as being a conductor and that all those present um, are the instruments that they're guiding to create this sacred musical experience using that analogy. Um, and so how do we do that? First, it's a lot easier to talk to someone who's non-responsive. And so in those hours before death, unlike in the movies, the person is generally non-responsive. And so encourage each person that's present there to go in alone and talk to the person that's dying and say everything that's in your heart that you need and want to say. Talk about the good times, talk about the challenging times. You know, there's no perfect life, uh, no perfect relationship and talk about the positive and the negative. Say everything in your heart and have everyone there have their own time. The person that's dying is processing their life and it's helpful to them. And of course it's helpful to us. That's such a good point because many times at the scene of a death, I've seen the entire family kind of crowd into the room and all sit around the bedside, but that really inhibits many people from speaking what's on their heart because they, there are things they would like to say that they can't say in front of all the other family members. So they, they tend to hold that in and not say it. And I think you're exactly right. Plus if people go in one at a time, they can maintain just a quiet, space for the patient too that's not as chaotic and hectic with with everyone being there at once yeah i mean it i think it's beneficial to both the patient and everyone who's there and after everyone's had their turn to go in alone then yes all be together and you can sit on the bed you can cuddle and hold you can touch you know, we tend to be afraid, oh, I don't want to get too close. Uh, you know, just love them and be with them. This is your last chance, your last opportunity. Um, but take the individual first, then come together as a group. At the moment of death, I encourage everyone there to say goodbye. You know, just, you know, we love you, mom. And we, oh, we're going to miss you. We love you. Um, and then as the conductor, I will often kind of guide that family. Oh, look, mom's breathing just like I told you she was going to, like a little fish. Remember, we talked about that. Oh, and it's going to get slower and slower 
tell her goodbye. There's probably going to be one or two more breaths. Here comes another one, you know, walk them through and mom's gone now. Let's how, and then here's what I often do is give them a chance to stand around the bed, to cry, to touch. And then I say, Hey, how about all of you go out into the living room or the kitchen, get a cup of coffee, and I'm going to kind of tidy the room. And then I'll come out after I've done that. Is that okay with you? And every once in a while, I'll have particularly a daughter say, no, 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 I want to stay with mom. And when that happens, I'll say, great, let's you and I, you help me do this for mom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wash her areas if they need washing. I don't think a whole bath is necessary for some people. Some families want to do that, but I don't push it. Let's get the messy areas and clean up. I straighten the body. I often raise the head of the bed up a little bit and put on um, a clean, maybe a clean sheet. And then I will go and I will tidy the room. I now have the body tidied and raised up a little bit, the head kind of straightened. Then I tidy the room, get rid of the medicine um, and just kind of make it a soft light. And then I go out and say, before we call the funeral home, wouldn't each one of you like to come in and say goodbye one more time? It's not going to be the same at the funeral home. This is your last chance to privately say goodbye. And I will stay here while each one of you do that. Mm. And well, I wanted to, I just wanted to ask you when you were talking about the body, I was at a facility where I saw uh, after a patient died, they had some small pillows that they put underneath the chin to prop up to help keep the mouth closed. And I didn't know if you had any thoughts about that, um, that issue, because I know oftentimes the, the mouth stays open. And I have just let it be. Um, and I guess the reason I've let it be is because that's what death looks like. I'm not trying to avoid death. I'm trying to get everyone to say their goodbyes in death. So I'm tidying, but I'm not trying to make them look normal. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that, that's a really good point. And then um, chances are like you may have prepared them for that, or at least you tell explain to them that that's normal. Oh, absolutely. You know, all of the pre death work is is education up to that moment. Uh, and so that's why having earlier referrals, you know, this is so important, because that gives us time to teach about this moment that we're all coming to, where if we get someone and they're in labor, which is I consider one to three weeks before death, then we're doing crisis intervention uh, because no one has said dad's dying now and we're talking a week or so. Um, and so it's crisis intervention. After the, after the everyone has gone in and said their goodbyes. Then I say, we call the funeral home when the, and I stay. And when the funeral home comes, I say to the family and, and during that time, while we're waiting for the funeral home, that's the time I talk to them about funerals and visitations and why visitation is so important. I suggest they write letters to their loved one. The kids can draw pictures, put those in the coffin with them. I give them all these ideas on how this visitation and funeral can be. So funeral home arrives and I say to the family, I will go in and be your representative. How about you guys stay here in the living room and I'll go in. 
And as soon as that funeral home lift people lift the body, then I am going to straighten the bed. I might put clean sheets on the bed. Um, and I'm going to have a pillow on the bed, whether it's a hospital bed or a regular bed. And then I'm going to find something to put on that pillow. I've already been thinking about it this whole time. I have put rosaries, I've put a flower, I've put pictures. I took a picture off the wall one yeah. time. I couldn't find anything else. But what I'm doing is creating a sacred space. That room holds a memory. And in that house, every time the people go by or in that room, they're going to remember that dad died in that room. And so I want them to leave a lot. I leave a little light on. I don't close the door. And when I leave the room, I want them to be able to walk by because they're going to be scared and look in and not see a dark room, but see a soft light and a made bed and a little something on the pillow. Wow, that's, that is beautiful. That's so beautiful. I just love that idea and how much you can help the family in their adjusting to the grieving process by by creating that sacred space and and maintaining it and they can maintain it for as long as they need to within the home because that room has a memory and in in supporting the family um the grief work begins literally at the moment of death. Now there's pre-grief and we grieve and that's a whole nother issue. But the actual he's dead begins at the moment of death. And yes, there's numb and I mean, that's a whole nother workshop. But we're by softening the memory, um, it will affect them for the rest of their life. It's a great opportunity for us to heal this really tragic, sad experience that all of us are going to have when someone we love or don't love dies. Um, do you, I love that you said you're already thinking about this while you're there earlier with a family. You've already probably picked out what it is you're going to leave on the pillow because you're, it's in your, in your mind and you're, you're aware and you're paying attention to things. So you've already noticed something in the room or something special that you could leave on the pillow. And I think that is really the kind of thinking that we need to do. We need to always be anticipating and be, be, be thinking creatively about what can I do here because every situation is unique. Every home, every root death room that you're in is going to be unique and you have to think on your feet in the moment in order to find those special things. Well, and now some people have said, well, yes, as an agency, we've got a little card and we've got a, an artificial flower or something that we put on the pillow, but that's not the same. It's not the same of finding something personal of the person that died. You know, that that really is more powerful. That's so true. And you mentioned the lighting and how soft lighting helps create that sacred space. Do you utilize that as the patient's dying when the family's there? Do you dim the lights a bit in the room then also so it's not so harsh? Yes, because you're creating a soft, gentle environment. And if you've got music, have it soft. You don't have to have music. Um, but if you do, then have it soft. Um, and I think we human beings sense on an interior level the sacredness of this and so we tend to talk softer. Uh, our Just our whole energy is softer. 
I will say that fear will negate all of that softness. Um, and all that's why our pre death work is so important because we want the family to understand that what dad's doing is normal, that nothing pathological is happening. And that's, I think the number one thing that we do is to neutralize the fear, which then allows the family to experience this normal, natural, non-pathological event. Mm. I love that. That's a beautiful way to put it, neutralizing the fear, because I can imagine in families who have not been prepared for the dying process itself, they don't know what to expect or for the moment of death, it could be very frightening. And some families might withdraw and choose not to even go in the room or not to be with their loved one. And then they're missing such a precious moment to have one last interaction with that person. Well, they are, and most of us have not experienced death. All we've got is the movies. All we have is television. And so when dad or mom or doesn't do what the TV has someone doing, then it's, oh my goodness, something's wrong. You know, something bad is happening. Um, so it's so important to build up to this sacred moment. And and I'm wondering if if this can be achieved too, if a patient, say, is dying in the ICU, maybe they've been taken off a ventilator. Um, and I don't know if you have experience with this, but are there things we can do even in a sterile, cold hospital room to make it warmer and feel more like a sacred space for the patient. You know, how many times have you and I walked into a hospital room and dad's in bed dying and every the family is literally holding on to their hands and standing five feet away from the bed. No one's talking and they're just looking because they don't know what to do. And so in a medical environment, whether it's a nursing facility or the ICU or a hospital room, we need to guide the people and give them permission. You know, just because usually ICUs, um, if a death, if they've got enough time, they'll move them out of the direct ICU into a private room. And what as the conductor, no matter where we are conducting this dying experience, we tell the family, you can hold, you can crawl in bed, you can sing to them if that's what you've done, you can read to them if that's what you want. But while all this is happening, the conductor is saying, oh, look, now his breathing is getting slower. You're preparing them for the moment that breath stops. But you can do that anywhere. You can do that in a car if you come to an accident, really. Uh, it doesn't make any difference where you are. And yet hospitals give this um, impression of sterility and formalness. And so it's up to us, the conductor, to get beyond that. and get closeness and touch. And I like too that you were talking about pointing out the signs of dying, that death is near, because even families who've been told about those signs may not actually recognize that that's what's happening. And they may not realize that's, that's where we are now. This is the stage that we've entered into now, and that's what's happen, happening. 90% of our work as caregivers is education because I have to say it again, we don't die like they do in the movies. So we have to educate um, what, so that the family can get beyond the fear that they're bringing. 
they're frightened. Um, and I think frightened because it's of the unknown. And then I'm going to add this. If anyone in the family has been with someone previously who has died, they're going to bring that and think that's what's going to happen. I see this um, with pain uh, before death. You know, Aunt Bertha died 20 years ago in of cancer in the, of the pancreas and horrible pain. And now dad is dying of cancer of the lung. Well, everyone's going to think that dad is going to die in pain and just like Aunt Bertha died, unless we teach them otherwise. It's so true when people have a story from the past about how someone died. Sometimes those get handed down. I've noticed too, from generation to generation, the whole family may talk about it and everyone knows about it, but you're right. It sets things up in a negative way to, to be less open to what's actually happening and be more worried about the story that, that they've heard in the past. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a real common, um, situation that I see, you know, a lot is a person has the family has an idea of what dad's dying is going to be like. And when he doesn't fill that ideal, um, then they think something's wrong. Yeah. Um, I also, I've heard you say this a few times, and I love it that our work in hospice is actually for that moment of death, we're preparing for the moment of death. And how many times does that get completely forgotten? And I, and I encounter lots of hospice workers who I think are not even have never even thought about that fact, like they're focused on the day to day and making sure the patient's comfortable, or not in pain, but not realizing all the work they're doing is to help this patient get to the moment of death and, and afterwards. And yes, we re alleviate their pain. We want them to be able to enjoy being with their family and have these interactions. But if you forget that the moment of death is, is the actual moment that we're working toward, that's when I think people forget to educate the family and talk to them and, and, and they don't lead people necessarily to that point as well as they could. Well, and end of life work is different. Taking care of someone at end of life is different than taking care of someone who's going to get better. And our medical model um, today is fighting, literally fighting disease. And end of life focus is on people that have disease. And it's really a challenge for a lot of medically based caregivers, uh, professionals to look at the whole person. Just because you can't heal the physical body doesn't mean there isn't healing to do. You heal the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. And as we get more and into hospice, more and more healthcare professionals from the medical model, we have to really be careful in hospice that we don't, that we make sure their training and their education focuses on end of life because it's different. It's very different and understanding what is normal during these stages of dying is crucial because otherwise you may pathologize what's normal and what's happening or think, oh no, this person needs medications. This person needs to go to the hospital. You know, you may not realize this is just the normal process and may try to intervene in certain ways that are not helpful. Oh, absolutely. We in the medical profession, our medical model, we're geared toward fixing. And if we can't fix, then there's a sense of failure. 
So we have to keep trying to fix. And it just goes against everything we've been trained to do to say, oh my goodness, I've done the best I can and death is going to come. Everybody dies. And we in the medical profession tend to forget that, you know. Oh, so true. So true. It is a big mindset shift to come into hospice work from traditional medical work. But it feels to me that it shouldn't be, first of all, that all medical providers should have some understanding about the end of life and death and dying. It shouldn't seem like it's something completely separate from the work that they're doing. That's something I've always had an issue about. Like, why, why now does it feel like um, the the treating physician has nothing to do with the patient. Oh, because they've been they've been moved into a different place. Now they're doing something that doesn't uh, doesn't appeal to me or isn't part of my specialty. So I I will have nothing to do with that. When I don't know, death and dying should be part of all of it. We should be aware of it in every specialty. Well, and I think the operative word that you're using is specialty we've become in our medical model so specialized that we kind of lose track of this total being that feels that thinks that all our body all works in sync with each other and yet our medical model has separated heart they've separated bone you know all of that and so we're lacking that continuity in medical care. Um, I, we're lacking. That's a mm -hmm. huge lack. I yeah, it's, it's very sad. And it's to the detriment of the patients, but to the providers as well. And um, I, I was going to tell you a few years ago, I got a phone call from a woman OBGYN physician who told me her mother was dying, was she was caring for her mother at home who was in hospice. And she said, I have no idea what happens when someone dies. And she, as a doctor, she hadn't been with a patient who died before. And she said, I don't want to admit that to the hospice staff that I don't know anything. And she said, also, I, I think she said, they're too polite to teach me anything because they assume I know. And so I spent an hour on the phone and we talked all the way through what she could expect and what changes would happen as her mother died. And I, I was grateful that she was humble and able to ask those questions, but to her own detriment, she'd never been trained about death and dying. And when she needed that information in her own personal life, she, she didn't have it. And, um, I think as doctors face death in their personal lives, that may be when a shift happens and they decide, oh, this is something I should have known about, but it doesn't, doesn't happen until then, it seems. I know, you know, our, our hospice medical director um, brought his mother-in-law on service. And it's been so long ago, I don't remember all the details of what was wrong with her, but her nurse, her hospice nurse uh, at team meeting said, you know, Mrs. So-and-so is um, starting labor and, you know, sharing this with the team. And the hospice medical director said in front of everyone, no, you're wrong. She's <laughs> not going to die now. And it was like, Oh my goodness. Wow. He, hospice medical director and he doesn't understand dying at all. Now, this is a long time ago. Um, and we've come a long way with hospice medical directors. You know, they have are more knowledgeable than they were in the 70s and 80s. I also remember um and I guess I better not say what school it is, but there was a, a medical school that I once a year would have um, an end of life lecture. It was a weekend conference, we'll say, that for second year med students 
and it was optional. They didn't have to take it. And that was all the end of life training that physician or would be physician would ever receive unless they specifically sought it. Hmm. I hope it's better than it, than that now. I, I hear it's getting better in some schools. It can't, couldn't be fast enough in my mind. I mean, it, because it will change everything about how we treat patients with terminal illnesses. In fact, if we can make physicians more aware of, of the end of life and more willing to, to be there and step up for their patients. But, um, I, who knows? I, we're sitting here hoping and waiting. We were doing our part, trying to educate people. But I wanted to ask you too, as far as, so the conductor, to be the conductor who comes in at the end of life and is helping to orchestrate this sacred space at the end of life, are there specific things you recommend for, say, the, the hospice worker or death doula for their own mindset and how they get themselves ready to be the conductor? What do they need to work on in order to be, to have the right frame of mind and the right attitude to create the sacred space? Well, I think first, we as professionals have to look at ourselves. Um, and I, you've probably heard me tell this story about Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross when, when I spent time with her. And she described all of us as coffee pots and that what's going on in the world is the clear water. Our personal life experiences is the coffee grounds. And as life experiences come through who we are, it comes out distorted. If you're going to work in end of life, you've got to look at your own coffee grounds first. What is your belief system? What do you think happens when someone dies, when the body dies? Do you think it's a failure? As most medical professionals think, you have to really look at yourself first. And then you need to get educated on dying. You know, what? how does the body die? There is a process. You have to recognize that there's only two ways to die, gradual or fast, and that gradual death has a process. Learn that so you understand end of life. And with that knowledge, that reduces the fear that we, I mean, every human being has some degree of fear when it comes time to die and to deal with death and dying because it's an unknown. You know, we don't know and we're always afraid of the unknown. So in being a professional in this work, you've got to look at your, your fears, neutralize them, and you do that through education, through learning. So you learn how death happens, how it progresses, and then you have to learn what to do when all this is happening because taking care of someone at end of life is not what you do for someone who's going to get better. So you've got to learn what to do because there's a whole, it's a whole field in itself. It's really true. And I think part of that learning is kind of your creative tools that, that you bring with you, because at least what I found is I was constantly walking into situations that were unique, like, oh my gosh, I've never seen exactly this, this situation before. I've got to think on my feet. I've got to figure out how will we handle this? What's the best way to deal with this? It's never the same. And you might even imagine, oh, these two patients are similar age, similar diagnosis. They, you know, you might be able to pick out all the count commonalities, but it will still be very different in each household, in each home that you go. Because you're dealing with personalities. You know, we die the way we've lived. We die according to our personality. And yes, we'll do a lot of similar things, but all those things are going to be determined and affected by our personality, 
and how we've lived our life because we will die in the same manner that we've lived our life. Yeah, and it's and it's so true. So it's possible you may go in wanting to create a sacred space, but finding family members who are too afraid, too afraid to go in and be with their loved one. And then you might have to think of what could what could we do instead? How could we ha handle this for them instead? If they're if they're fearful of being with the person as they're dying or being with the body after death. However, I see my job as neutralizing that fear and the challenge of getting the person in that room to say goodbye because they're two months later they're going to thank me for being able to go in there and i many many times i've said how about i go in with you mm. i'm going to hold your hand and you and i will walk in together and i'll stay with you and you don't have to say out loud what you want mom to to know think it in your heart because she'll get the message and i'll stand here and we'll be together you know there are skills that we can use to get that family in uh who is not going in simply because they're afraid hmm. That's perfect. And as you said before, then we have to deal with our own fear of death too, to make sure it doesn't rise up in us unexpectedly in moments like that. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of my challenges was working with children. You know, I had three children at home and I just, as a professional, just couldn't do it. And fortunately there was another nurse that took all the children, you know, and they became her, her patients. But we were on call a week at a time. And the policy, which I feel strongly about, is if you're not on call, you don't go to see a patient, no matter what that relationship is, if you're not on call. So I was at the bedside with several children, but it took its toll on my heart. It was really hard. Mm, yes. Oh, I, I can totally imagine that as a mother and a grandmother now, I can imagine that. Um, I wanted to say, I think the creating this sacred space at the time of death and, and after the death seems really helpful also for the hospice provider or death doula, even in terms of our own grief, that when we can create that sacred space and be part of creating that, that's helpful for us in some ways to find closure around that death as well. And, you know, we, we, if we get the referral soon enough, we're going to develop a relationship and even a bond with the family and with the patient. I will say that most of the people I took care of, I took care of as children of God. I did not get emotionally involved, but I can tell you on two hands, the number of people that did get in Barbara's heart and that I grieved for immensely when they were gone. I did get personally involved and I sent letters, we exchanged, let, you know, I can, but if all of my patients got that deep into my heart, I wouldn't be doing this work today. You know, we can love and support and guide families and not get emotionally involved. We can still be gentle and caring but we don't want to be emotionally involved with every patient. Yeah. It'd be easy to do because there's a lot of dear people out there. But yeah, you're exactly right. That's part of self care is learning how to have those boundaries. And I was thinking about, uh, you know, these last few years of the pandemic and the so many stories we've heard of hospital providers becoming burned out and partly because of seeing so many patients die 
under, you know, under their care when they hadn't been used to seeing so much death in the hospital and wishing that we could share this, just this idea of creating a little sacred space when someone dies in that room, even briefly for a short while, it seems to me, maybe that could be helpful to those, those care providers as they're coping with so much death in the hospital of having just a sacred moment or, or something sacred around the death to help them feel like we, we did everything we could. We cared about this person, you know, and, and, uh, so that it doesn't feel so impersonal and cold to them. Well, and during COVID, I did a lot of zooms with hospitals and, um, on this very on this very thing and what i suggested was that at the end of your shift that you go home and the first thing you do when you walk into your home is you take your clothes off and you get in the shower and let that hot water pour over you and watch in your mind all the worries, all the stress, all the emotion, all the sadness, because we all feel, you know, sad, all the sense of failure, all the energy, watch it in your mind, go down the drain. And then after you've let that water pound on you and literally pound out all of the emotions that you're carrying, then imagine the water is sparkling, beautiful energy light and let it wash over you now mm -hmm. and bring that sense of peace and joy to life. Then get out of the shower, dry yourself off, put your pajamas on and spend the rest of the day or the evening enjoying life mm -hmm. so that you can go back refreshed. So I think we have to wash that energy off because if we don't wash the energy off, we will carry it mm -hmm. to our detriment. That's really beautiful. And so I love that in a way that kind of completes the whole ritual in a sense um, by having just our own little practices we can do for ourselves at the end of the day when we come home after work to take care of ourselves. And it seems like that works for hospice providers and death doulas and hospital personnel, anyone who's who's taking care of people who are dying or in other traumatic circumstances. You know, um, I got into this work because I thought I had an understanding about life and death and that I could deal with this. And I went from one death to another to another. And about a year after I started working in hospice um, and all my patients died, I, I was being a facilitator in a group grief workshop. I was really kind of watching, but I was in it. And I'm the one that fell in a little heap on the floor, hmm. crying, saying there are so many ghosts. I just kept saying it over and over. And I realized that I had no closure, that I went from one death to another to another, and that I had to develop some kind of ritual for me with the death of each person. I went to visitations and said goodbye to the body and to the family. There are less and less visitations today. So, I mean, a journal where you write the the patient's name their death date and a couple of sentences about them that will give you closure and then say thank you for coming into my life mm -hmm. um, but it gives you a, a, a closure maybe you have a little space in in your room with a a candle and you come in and you light the candle and you say, John Williams, thank you for coming into my life and blow the candle out, you know, create your own ritual so that you can stay in this work. Mm, yes. 
so important. And those are just beautiful ideas of how to do that again, as part of self care. And I, I did want to go back. I forgot this from earlier, but you mentioned that you would talk to families about why visitations are important. And I, I think it's really sad that we don't see visitations happening and maybe like the pandemic probably made that much less possible over the last few years. But I just, wanted you to talk a little bit about what you would emphasize for families of the benefits of having a visitation. There's something about seeing your loved one in a funeral home, dressed up with makeup on and hair that doesn't even look like how she always wore it. Um, to see that open casket, there's something in your being that says, yeah, mom's dead if you just do them from the funeral from the home from the death and go straight to the to cremation or go straight to a closed casket in our grieving there's something that a little area that says well maybe it's not quite true maybe she's really just in hawaii you know, where she always loved to go. Seeing that dead body in a coffin um, says, yeah, it's true. Mom's dead. And yes, it hurts terribly, but that kicks in the reality um, that our grieving is then going to begin. So, and, and I literally use those words that I just said to families. And this is why mm -hmm. I want a visitation. And then I say, you know, write mom a letter and have the grandkids and draw pictures and put the letters and the pictures in the coffin. Keep, mm. keep the rings, keep the jewelry. You want that, but put the letters in with her um, and send her on her way. Mm. I do love that. And I, I'll always remember my mom's visitation. And what was so nice about it is that it, it took place over a few hours and people came and went. So there was never a huge crowd all at once, just a steady stream of people. And there was time to actually talk for a few minutes. But the funeral was chaotic. The, the room was packed. There were so many people. There was no way to really talk or really connect with anyone who was there. So you're right. The visitation is very special. Oh, few, um, funerals are about listening. You don't really interact. Visitations are about visiting. And you have all this interaction. And that's what we need in our grief. Because words don't mean anything when we're grieving. So sitting through a funeral with a bunch of words, it really doesn't mean anything. But having your neighbors and your aunts and uncles and friends all come to a visitation and they're there to support you and talk to you and hold you, you know, that's where the healing can begin, not the funeral. Mm, so true. Well, Barbara, we're, run, we're running out of time, but this has been such a great conversation talking all about creating this sacred space just before, during, and after death and how powerful that is. And I am just so grateful for you. It's been really fun having these conversations where we really dig into a topic and we can go deep with it instead of trying to cover cover everything. And I really so enjoy that. And I want to thank you for being a conductor here <laughs> during our conversations too. Well, you and I have, have walked in similar shoes. And I think that that helps this conversation uh, so much is because we've both been there. Yeah, so true. Well, I just, I can't wait for the next one. I really enjoy so much talking with you and looking forward to more topics. And we've had more of them suggested by listeners who are always welcome to get in touch with us by social media. Let us know what you'd like to hear about. 
But uh, I guess we have to say goodbye, Barbara, but thanks so much again for all of your wisdom and your time. <laughs> uh, I've enjoyed, I enjoy our back and forth and I'll see you again soon. Yes, definitely. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Barbara Carnes. As always, I love talking with Barbara and we could talk all day about hospice issues and she'll be back again in two more months. So stay tuned in the future for more conversations with Barbara Carnes. And again, make sure you've subscribed if you haven't already and tell other people about this podcast and the YouTube channel if you find it helpful to you. And until then, I'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.